In ancient Roman times, time was kept each month using three key days, the Calends, the Nones, and the Ides. And the Ides fell in the middle of each month, either on the 13th or the 15th, depending on which month it was. Here in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary engineering, we pride ourselves on being versatile in our talents and strive to understand the core principles of engineering. Like the Ides on the Roman calendar, IDES and MDE students fall in the center of the world of engineering. To celebrate our 50th anniversary, we are sitting down with students and alumni to understand the impact of this program. So I'm Alex. And I'm Bryce. And this is the, the Ides of Engineering. MDE is just the right program for this generation and for this time. Being a pest is a huge stepping stone. And that journey for you is part of you building a new level of resilience. In this episode, we interview Dr. Richard E. Grace, who founded the Division of Interdisciplinary Engineering Studies in September of 1969. Dr. Grace began at Purdue as a metallurgical engineering professor in 1954, teaching undergraduate and graduate courses, as well as supervising graduate research programs. As head of the Division of the Interdisciplinary Engineering Studies, he personally counseled more than a thousand students and developed academic plans of study in fields such as acoustical, architectural, biomedical, environmental, nuclear, and systems engineering. We hope you enjoy this special edition of Ides of Engineering, where we'll learn about the beginnings of this program and hear from the person that helped get the school to where it is today. Dr. Grace, you just got done with your luncheon with the uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary program. Yes, and it was a great luncheon. Yeah. so good, good times. I guess my first question for you, Dr. Grace, is how did you first become involved with this program? Um, easy one. As a uh, beginning faculty member, and now this is uh, 1955, as a beginning faculty member, uh, every one of the schools of engineering had free or volunteer help uh, to make freshman engineering work. And um, I was, quote, volunteered by my department head to uh, spend at least a half a day over there um, advising students on curriculum and whatever, whatever questions, whatever problems came up. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's, a, the, there's some perspective in this. Um, if we go way back, the schools of engineering did not have a common freshman year at all. Uh, each curriculum was separate hmm. and distinct, and you came in and to study mechanical, electrical, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And um, in about 1934, ancient history, <laughs> the then dean of engineering, A. A. Potter, uh, decided that we needed to have a common freshman year mm -hmm. so that the young people could sort out their views. And so this, this common freshman year then went along on a volunteer basis until about 1950-something, 54, 5, 6, mm -hmm. uh, when the, the then Dean Potter retired and the new Dean George Hawkins took the reins and he created the first Department of Freshman Engineering uh, in around 1954, 5, perhaps 54-ish. Mm -hmm. so, uh, at the time that I got here as a brand new assistant professor, uh, I simply got assigned to spend a half a day or so. Um, and it was vaguely like fraternity rush, I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you, because there, there was a competition. There's always been an unstated and an unwritten competition between the schools that um, we want students. We yeah, want yeah. good students. We want the best students. Everybody does. But we want more for our school. We want more mechanicals, or we want more electricals. Mm -hmm. And so I was representing metallurgical engineering, wow. which is the school that either has two T's or two L's, and no, <laughs> no one is ever quite so sure about that. One. <laughs> so any, We're anyway, it's yeah. a small, it's a small school. Usually, is one or two percent mm -hmm. of the engineering population. And I used to get over there and answer questions and make sure the kids were moving in the right direction, but also tell them a little bit about metallurgical engineering yeah. as a profession. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was my start. And um, uh, the department then 
was called Department of Freshman Engineering. And it became engineering education much, much later, um, 40 years later. It, um, so anyway, that, that, that's an early start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if I were going to uh, summarize engineering, engineering education over my career, I would say change is the word. Mm -hmm. I Stealing have cost. seen a change in technology. Mm -hmm. oh, oh my, if, if we go from um, pencils and paper to computers, mm -hmm. there is a change beyond, you. well, you, you guys know better than I. If I go into uh, the matter of gender, um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, we used to joke that the schools of engineering were binary. There was either one or zero women enrolled in the entire <laughs> college of engineering at any one time. And uh, there were very few that graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, ones and twos were the occasional numbers mm -hmm. of female graduates. And now I don't know the number, but it's up to close to uh, 25, 22, 22, 25 percent. Mm -hmm. um, one of my responsibilities was, was to improve all of the women in engineering programs. And I joked with Jane Daniels one day that why not 50 percent? Why not 50, 50, 50? And uh, we both sat back and had a laugh and said, well, how about a little more realistic than that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we said a third. And we still haven't gotten there yet. We're still in the 20s. I mm -hmm. uh, don't know whether it's 22, 25 percent. Um, the women have done just fine. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they're obviously certainly. competing well for jobs. Mm -hmm. Super, super, as a matter of fact. Now, on the, on the flip side of the coin, I'm a bit of a heretic. Mm -hmm. um, today, um, one of the local jokes was I urged the students not to let, let their coursework interfere with their college education. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so yeah. I am, I have always uh, believed in that. Um, there is so much more to learn at Purdue in terms of uh, social skills, in terms of the, the arts, the literature, uh, going to convocations, going to football games, uh, learning things that just don't happen in the classroom. Yeah. And so um, it, it is a, a, a very rich experience. And if you go by the numbers, um, you're in 15 hours, credit hours, and perhaps uh, that constitutes maybe three, four, five hours a day mm -hmm. and a few hours for homework. Mm -hmm. um, but my goodness, you have 15 more hours a day at mm -hmm. least to do something do else, something. and yeah. you can't sleep for 15. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Lord knows that college kids never get enough sleep. True. Um, so whether it's student life, whether it's student activities, uh, whether it's life in the residence halls or the Greek system, uh, there is so much more to Purdue and so much more to learn than the classroom stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I don't minimize the classroom stuff at all. Uh, if you decide you want to go to graduate school, you better have a B-plus average. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, uh, I had fun down to a B-plus average. <laughs> and at that point in time, I said the fun, the fun is over. All right, well, well, uh, we, well we, put. We needed like B's, B's for sure and yeah. a sprinkling of A's. <laughs> and um, uh, I did take a C or two, I believe, in physical chemistry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I even had to date the... Uh, a uh, physical chemist's professor's daughter once or twice to, uh, <laughs> to make, make to sure something make good through. happened in that department. <laughs> don't don't think it helped. Uh, and we we're still good friends. Uh, she lives 20 miles out of town. We Very see cool. each other often. So, Very cool. Very and she cool. and my wife started kindergarten together. So this is a close knit little community yeah. that Very we cool. have. So uh, the word is change. Uh, everything about engineering education is change. Um, and I, I think for the better. It used to be rote. Uh, there were simply no electives. Now there's plenty of time for yeah. electives. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be uh, very little contact with industry. Now there's the, the co-op pro program is a classic it's example of, yeah. of mm -hmm. where there's huge opportunities so many connections uh, for learning. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's, I like to think of this in a, in a very positive way, and I'm going to use the term upward march of humanity. 
And I think engineers don't pay quite enough attention to that. They're all busy with their projects their numbers, yeah. and with their computers and their their podcasts <laughs> as well. <laughs> and I think there's a bigger picture. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say um, whether you're a practicing engineer, college professor, whatever you are, you owe something to family, you owe something mm-hmm. to church, if you're so inclined. You, you need to give back to your community. Um, I followed that um, formula for myself. I've been on all of the foundation boards, the Art Museum Foundation, the Symphony Foundation, the Community Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've tried to give back um, whatever whatever my brains allow, yeah. uh, I've tried to help. And especially, um, a, a mantra of mine would be simply helping others. Yeah. Helping students, helping families, helping our neighbors, helping people do better in life. Mm-hmm. Like I'm helping you guys right now. How's that? <laughs> Bigger picture, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I think uh, one of the things that keeps coming up over and over again as we talk to different people is they just keep mentioning how great of a mentor you were to them while they were here. So uh, what I want to ask from you is what did that mentorship look like from your perspective? Um, you know, all right. Um, well, first of all, I hate to be crass, it was a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, Purdue University employed me yeah. to, to do a job and uh, uh, the job was the smaller part of it mm-hmm. uh, the critical part was finding out what was the what what what, what did the a young person want what did they need what was the issue if they had come to me there was an issue uh, it might have been a mother or a father um, giving a little too much guidance to a freshman, mm-hmm. or it might have been a girlfriend, <laughs> or it might have been a particular professor, mm-hmm. or it could have been something uh, much more serious, like getting caught cheating in class, for example, mm-hmm. or turning in a fake term paper. Uh, term paper. And so um, I simply addressed everything, every ounce of me focused on what the issue was and how to help. Mm-hmm. And I, um, never, I'm never, in, never short of words on how to help, I gotta tell you, but it was always in the context of what specific thing can we either do, can we change, can we offer up, if we, if we simply have to say, I'm sorry, then that's, that's, that's all we can do. Yeah. Or if we, we need to say, hey, I was wrong, or if it's just a matter of saying, um, how about we try Harry's? Uh, we're, we're not going to solve this problem in engineering administration. <laughs> we, we, might need, we might need to do a, um, a fluid mechanics lab, <laughs> to, to, to call it something. I, I invented the term as a uh, euphemism. Yeah. For taking uh, students who were 21 years old now, of course, yeah, uh, out for a beer, and um, many, 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 many over the uh, decades, um, students and I have, and groups of students and I have gone to Harry's. I have even taken the uh, president, President Bering, mm-hmm. and Iron Key. I used to take him down, cool. and uh, we used to. They used. The students always got the front window in Harry's when they knew that the president was coming, and we used to take him down for a little counseling too. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, full spectrum, whatever whatever it took, whether it was a personal moment, mm-hmm. uh, or whether it was a serious, a really serious moment, or whether it need, needed a little uh, lubrication, uh, whatever whatever it was, we got it done. All right. So. We don't have to delve too far into MD or IDES, um, but you were at the forefront of that program, and I guess we want to talk about what, uh, where the need for that program came from, and um, how it got its bearings, how it okay. got rolling. Let me let me tell you a um, a proverb: Necessity is the mother of invention. Now you think that, well, that's probably sounds like England 19, or 1870 or 1780. Uh, that's Plato's Republic. Uh, okay. 
uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So this program, all of this IDE business that we've been talking about, uh, started give or take in 1965-ish uh, with the Vietnam War. And there was a series of events. Uh, I referred to Woodstock. I referred mm -hmm. to hell no, we won't go. Um, the country was simply so tired of hearing about Vietnam and difficulties that there, one, one of the very specifics was that Dow Chemical uh, was making napalm. napalm yeah. mm -hmm. And um, the college kids around the country understood a, a way to stop some of that. Uh, they uh, used to have sit-ins in the placement service, in mm -hmm. Purdue placement service, and uh, across the country, uh, whenever Dow Chemical would come to the campus and uh, simply block students from talking to Dow. It, it, was, it was kind of a, a rough and tumble situation. Mm -hmm. But out of all of this, there was an anti-technology movement that swept across the country. Now you're wondering, what, what, where is the necessity piece of all this story? Freshman engineering, that was, that's that department that mm -hmm. we've been talking about. Freshman engineering normally took about 1,600, 1,500 to 1,600 beginning freshmen every year. Mm -hmm. That number was dwindling. It was dropping like a stone. And um, it got down to 1,200 and got down to 1,000. And finally, the president of the university came over and told uh, the engineering dean and the school heads, um, you guys better do something about this because the other deans at the, at the college, the other deans here at Purdue have all said, if engineering is gonna lose all those students, they don't need all those faculty members and you, Mr. President, can just slide a few faculty members over to chemistry, mm -hmm. over to physics, mm -hmm. over to liberal arts, over to business and the engineering faculty is going to take a big hit. Right. And um, suddenly necessity became real. Mm -hmm. And so um, the question is what to do. We had started a new school of nuclear engineering in 1960. It had small enrollments, 50, 100 students. That was not the answer. Uh, the women in engineering program was only a one year old. So that was not going to be the answer. Um, we created vans that went out on, across the state trying to tell the story of engineering to the high schools. That wasn't the answer. We needed something to do that had splash, that had panache, that had a new twist to it all. And I, I knew from, coming in, from a, being in a small school, I, I was a metallurgical engineer, uh, which is a, a, a tiny part of the engineering spectrum. Mm -hmm. I knew that you, you needed a high-flying flag for something. And so um, I alone, uh, the engineering heads, I'll back up, the engineering head said, um, the hell with it, we'll just ride this, this out. He wouldn't, he wouldn't dare, <laughs> he, the president, wouldn't dare change yeah. uh, our, our programs. And I alone said, he will. Um, President Hansen was a fraternity brother of mine, as a matter of fact, as just as an aside, mm -hmm. and I knew him well. And I said, he's serious, we've got to do something. So I had observed that there were hints of change. Um, mechanical engineering had new acoustical engineering facilities out at the Herrick Labs. Mm -hmm. Civil engineering was experimenting with environmental controls, environmental coursework, Mm -hmm. and laboratories. Um, biomedical engineering was a hot, hot topic in electrical engineering, in chemical engineering, mm -hmm. and it was getting a, a foothold in mechanical engineering. And all of these were singular. It was Professor X in Double E was offering a biomedical engineering course. Uh, he was a distinguished professor but nobody knew about it except a handful of people in double E and maybe a handful outside. So I said, look, we've got to create a whole new series of titles, non-traditional engineering titles, 
uh, that we can sell. And so um, we started with acoustical engineering. Um, I never got to zygote engineering. I, I, I hoped that I would get to a Z, but I never found a Z. <laughs> but um, if, we, if we go down the list, um, architectural engineering, uh, systems engineering, biomedical engineering, engineering management, mm -hmm. uh, pre-law, pre-med opportunities, um, systems engineering, oh, and engineering management. Mm -hmm. um, the management school was eating our lunch with freshmen coming in mm -hmm. as to being a, a better business opportunity for freshmen. And so we created an engineering management program mm -hmm. to kind of Combine do a little that. pushback in that direction. <laughs> Yeah. And so, out of all of this, um, it took about four years, and uh, times changed. I can't say that this was the sole factor in uh, the comeback of engineering, but we were back up to our 1,500, 1,600 beginners within about five years, mm -hmm. and the total enrollment in freshman engineering was 2,500, 2,600, because there were always third and fourth year students. Mm -hmm. And so, there's no question in my mind uh, that this was the right time, the right place, the right set of players, um, and yet I was the I was the nucleus. I have to tell you, I was the only one who said, "Folks, we got to do this, or mm -hmm. we're we're going to the ship is going to won't sink, but it's going to lilt mm -hmm. a bit." So, um, in those in those years uh, at the start, um, I. I worked with all of the engineering schools. Uh, the department heads were not happy with this. Mm -hmm. uh, was taking time and energy away from their faculty. Mm -hmm. But I got about 100 faculty members in the College of Engineering who said, this is a good idea. Now, it was a good idea because it was a good personal idea for them that they wanted to study six, they were studying system engineering and they wanted some publicity. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, to be recognized for it. So if you were studying acoustical, architectural, environmental, systems engineering, whatever it was, and you felt a little stymied by the fact that you were in chemical engineering or that you were in AA, here was an opportunity to blow your horn. Mm -hmm. You could now talk to undergraduate students one-on-one -on -one, and you could create a plan of study, mm -hmm. an individualized plan of study. And where, where I got my idea was, uh, I'm a Carnegie Tech, Carnegie Mellon PhD. Um, super time in life, it's come second to Purdue, but it was super <laughs> time in life. Um, but every one of us, we, we were all studying the same thing, but we were all on individual plans of study. Every graduate student was on a, a, a separate plan of study. And I said, quite frankly, what the hell? Why can't we do this for undergraduate students mm -hmm. as well? And that's when we created these sample plans of study. We must have had 100 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them never sold. Mm -hmm. But the biggies <laughs> that did sell are the ones that are still around. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was this collection of non-traditional titles that uh, revolutionized the approach to freshman engineering. Mm. And so for the student, who somehow knows they, they want mechanical or electrical, uh, that's super, that's wonderful. And for the student who is a little uncertain or has or needs to test or wants to diversify, test the ice a little bit and see if they fall in or they don't fall <laughs> in, uh, this, this was the right vehicle for many of them and continues to be the right vehicle for, for many of them. Yeah. But uh, I have to tell you, everybody on the engineering faculty doesn't think the same way. There's, there's a diehard group, um, let's just say in mechanical engineering, and they think that the sun rises and sets on mechanical engineering, that uh, George Washington was the first civil engineer, the sun still rises and sets on civil engineering, mm -hmm. and it turns out in the history a little, a little you, you need a little course in history right now? I'll, <laughs> sure. I'll give you, I'll give you one. Um, before 1900, in the 1880s, 1850, 1880s, if you can imagine, what did America need the most? Roads. Mm -hmm. 
And who built roads? Civil engineers. Mm -hmm. So civil engineering was top dog in the, in the 1800s until Henry Ford came along and put automobiles on those roads. And then guess who was top dog? Mechanical <laughs> engineering <laughs> became top dog for mm, 50 some years mm -hmm. until the computer. Transistor, <laughs> transistor came yeah. along after World War II and the electronics industry flourished mm -hmm. and double E became kingpin. Dog, yeah. And so it's, it's a, a history of the, the comings and goings, the rise and fall, <laughs> if you will, mm -hmm. of uh, engineering disciplines. And I'd be hard pressed to tell you today um, whether there is one single one uh, the electronics revolution looks like it continues, mm -hmm. but I don't think it has the edge. Um, aerospace, maybe, looks, you know, you'd think that with Apollo and all, and, and going to the moon, you'd think that would have captured a larger fraction of the engineering community, but it hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the thinking ones who are, are still going to go back to the moon and maybe go to Mars, <laughs> maybe not, but maybe mm -hmm. um, that may be the next group mm -hmm. uh, that will be the kingpin. That will be the top dog in engineering. It's <laughs> hard. It's hard to tell who's next. Yeah. But if history repeats, it was civil. It then was next. It was mechanical. It was. It's been electrical since 1945. Mm -hmm. Bell Labs and the transistor. And now it's a matter of they're all pretty good. Uh, so uh, we'll say IDE is leading the path. <laughs> oh, yeah. IDE yeah. Is, yeah. The, is the best one because they've got a, a, a broader view of engineering yeah. education than anybody else does. That's How's great. that, guys? That's perfect. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, it's been great. I, th I think you got more than you needed. Oh, yeah. I think well, so. Yeah. But anyway, just... All good. Very insightful. <laughs> <laughs> take, take the shears out, How, however you edit this stuff. <laughs> we'll do what, take, we, what take, we feel take, is appropriate. Take the junk out. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And yes. you picked the perfect ham. I love to do that. <laughs>